Good afternoon, everybody. I am so happy to see all of you here today. Um, yeah, so as Demetrius said, we are in the Cross and the Crown series. So we've been going through Ephesians 1, 16 through 19. Um, so before we dig into that, for, if you have your Bibles, please turn to Ephesians 1, because that's where we'll be. Um, but it, before we get into that, is anybody in this room adopted? Just me? Just me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> if I haven't shared it before, I think I've shared before that I am adopted. Um, my mom is my biological mother. She gave birth to me, um, but I never knew my biological dad. Um, but not having a dad changed when I was seven years old, um, when my mom got married. Uh, so something happened on that day, March 9th, 1996. Uh, life was suddenly different. There was a new permanent presence in our life. Uh, it wasn't much longer after that time, that, time uh, that my dad, my mom's new husband, adopted me and my brothers. Uh, so my mom's last name wasn't the only thing to change. My last name changed too when I was officially adopted by my dad. So before my dad came along, I was fatherless. I didn't have someone, a, a dad to call my own. I had a random legal last name uh, of someone I had not met. Well, I guess I met when I was, before I can remember. Uh, but when the papers were signed and submitted, I legally and forever became the daughter of Juan Maldonado. Uh, I became Robin Maldonado. That's my maiden name, Robin Maldonado. Uh, my name changed when I got married, obviously, because I'm Miller now. But my name forever was Robin Maldonado after that point. I had a new status, a new name, a new name that served as the guarantee of my new identity, a reminder that I am loved, that I'm cared for, and officially and legally the daughter of my father. When we become believers, when we say yes to Jesus and dedicate our life to him, we receive a new identity too. We become a child of God. We become brothers and sisters of Jesus having the same status as Jesus as a son or daughter of the king, of the creator of the universe. And because of that, we receive the benefits of being his children. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So if you haven't already, Ephesians 1 is where we are. Um, last week, Demetrius talked about hope. He talked about hope as being the confident expectation of God working, of being confident that God is going to do what God said he would do, that one day everything would be renewed and that we would be in God's presence forever. You know, Demetrius put on that apron and talked about the taste of what is to come. God gives us a taste of, of that forever with God. And we don't quite have the full portion. We don't quite have that whole bowl that's in the kitchen yet. But we know what's coming because God has given us a taste. So, to, so today, we're going to be talking about what that taste is. What has God given us a taste of? How are we getting that portion of our inheritance of God as God's children? What is that bowl full of? So, Ephesians 1, 16 through 19. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know, the, know what is the hope to which he, is, he has called you, and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, 
and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his might. So today we're going to be in that last part of verse 18. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? What, so what is that glorious inheritance? What is it? So if you go back up to Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14, just go a few verses up, Paul gives us a glimpse of what that inheritance is. So in him, in Jesus, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So when I read that, what that tells me is that the riches of our inheritance is full life in God's presence. That one day everything is going to be renewed, everything is going to be made new, and sin is going to be done away with once and for all, and the richest thing that we could have is living in God's presence. And so that means that the taste of what that is now, until we wait for that moment, is that God has brought his presence to us in the form of the Holy Spirit. And so um, we are tasting that inheritance because we have the Holy Spirit inside us. God's presence dwells in us. And the Holy Spirit has been given to us as a gift. So the Holy Spirit is our guarantee that we will have life with God forever. Sometimes, though, when life overwhelms us, when sin seems to take hold of us, the enemy, Satan, would love to snatch our hope. He wants us to waver in that confident hope that we have, and waver, yeah, waver in our confidence of God's good work in us and his salvation for us. But when this happens, the Holy Spirit, as the guarantee of our hope, does three things for us. One, the Holy Spirit reminds us of who we are. The Holy Spirit helps us live as children of God, and the Holy Spirit empowers us. Aren't those great things? Yes. Those are great things. I need all of those things. God helps us and reminds us and empowers us through the Holy Spirit. And we need these holy things from the Holy Spirit because sometimes when life gets stormy and patience and joy and peace seem elusive and nowhere to be found, and our place in God's kingdom as his children feels like it's a dream and not a reality. For moments like these, the Holy Spirit is the counselor and helper who reminds us of our status as sons and daughters of God. So the Holy Spirit reminds us. I don't know about you, but I need to be reminded of a lot of things. (laughs) Ever since I gave birth, ever since I became a mom, uh, my brain does not work like it used to. Uh, I didn't need a whole lot of reminders for things. I just remembered. I knew that things, when things were and what needed to be done, and I could just do it. Um, My brain doesn't do that anymore, (laughs) and I tend to forget a lot of things if I don't write them down. I I actually have to have a special app on my phone to remind me of the things I have to do every day because I will not remember otherwise. Um, Sometimes... We can get like this in our Christian life. We can, life overcomes us and we have a hard time remembering what Jesus has done for us. And, and we have a hard time and our hope and our confidence wavers because we wonder, am I really saved? In John 14, verses 25 through 26, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's encouraging them because his time is running out. And he says, I have spoken these things to you while I remain with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've told you. The Holy Spirit 
was sent to remind us of who we are and whose we are. Last week, Demetrius talked about our confidence uh, that, that through the work of Jesus, we can overcome guilt and overcome sin. And sometimes the enemy just loves to come in and disrupt that confidence. And sometimes we have a hard time remembering that we are saved, that we are God's child. We have a hard time remembering that all of our sin, past, present, and future, has been wiped clean. We, we get stuck where we are right now and think, how could God forgive us? How can God just love me the way I am right now? But the Holy Spirit comes in and reminds us of the gospel. He reminds us that we are a people changed by the Holy Spirit through salvation in Jesus, which makes us sons and daughters. The Holy Spirit reminds us that we're God's children, fully and wholly. So I have a picture of me and my dad. That's, that's my dad and I. Um, as, as you can see, uh, it's not obvious that we are father and daughter. <laughs> uh, he has dark skin. I do not. <laughs> um, his first language is Spanish. Mine is English. I do not bear the physical traits of my dad. And as a kid, I was often reminded of this. Uh, why does your last name sound Mexican? Uh, your skin is really white. Uh, if your dad is Mexican, then why is your skin white? Is that really your dad? Isn't he your stepdad, not your real dad? OK, but who is your real dad? I had outside forces constantly trying to tell me and convince me that my dad was not my real dad. That he and I didn't have the right kind of relationship that made sense to other people. That I should, ha I should not have the last name Maldonado because I didn't look like I should have the last name Maldonado. However, my dad loves me. He worked hard every single day to provide for us, to make sure we were sheltered, that we had food. He calls me his daughter. And when he would get similar kinds of things, people would say similar things to him, they got an earful. Because they cannot, nobody can tell him and nobody can tell us that he is not our real dad. He made sure that people knew that my brothers and I were his kids. And the adoption papers and our birth certificates say so. My dad is my dad. Our relationship makes it certain. He raised me. He was present. God does the same for you. The Holy Spirit is here to remind you right now in this moment that you are a child of God. He is reminding you of your status. He reminds, he's reminding you right now in this moment that you belong in God's family, in his kingdom. The Holy Spirit does this when, when the enemy would like to make you believe that you don't truly belong that you aren't really God's child, that you haven't really been saved. The Holy Spirit is the stamp of approval. It's that, that official seal of adoption that you, it's the proof of your adoption because you now have a new identity. You now bear God's name, his status, and his glory. Amen? Amen. We've been saved through faith in Jesus, and it's revealed by the Spirit, and you belong. You didn't earn the status. You don't deserve it. It's been given to you as a gift, and the Holy Spirit is here to remind you of that gift, regardless of how you feel about it. Regardless of your life choices, you are loved and adopted as a child of God because you believe in Jesus. So if you are here today and you're struggling with a sin or you're struggling with really, truly believing that you are a child of God, let 
and go because sin will not have the last word. Jesus already has the victory, and if that is who he is and we have his same status, then we have victory too. That is why we have hope. And this hope is powerful. When we truly and deeply understand this confident expectation that sin and death will not have the last word, the Holy Spirit helps us grow and develop as mature believers in the faith. And that, that's the second thing that he does for us. He helps, the Holy Spirit helps us. So when my parents got married, life changed. It changed for the better. It, it, it got more stable. It, there was less anxiety and fear. There was, there was a certain sense of peace. And I now had a dad that was kind and cared about me, and, and he would help me, and he would help me in a lot of ways, and there were lots of things that he taught me. Uh, one of the things that my dad and I love and that we share together is we love to draw. Um, I remember not long after they got married, um, I was I had one of those how-to draw books, like the cartoon ones. It's like how to draw Mickey Mouse or something like that. Um, and I didn't quite understand the pictures or what exactly it was telling me to do. Uh, I remember my dad sitting on the floor with me um, and, and showing me the instructions and, and, and doing it with me and showing me how to draw the circles and where to put the lines. And after a while, I began to understand how to read this how-to draw book. Um, and and I, I began to be able to do it on my own instead of needing his guidance. But I couldn't have got there without his guidance first in helping me develop those skills and show me what to do. He'll tell you now that I'm better than he is, but I think we're kind of similar skills, skill level now. Uh, but it's something that we still enjoy together. And it's something that, um, that he'll ask me to draw things for him so he could do like stuff with... Uh, yeah, the, he, we still do it together. <laughs> uh, um, and so much like my dad helped me understand how to use this how to draw book, and he helped me understand the mechanics of drawing, uh, the Holy Spirit is here to help us understand how to live life as children of God. He helps us grow, and he helps us, he, he helps us grow and strengthen in knowing the grace of God and understanding his word. And when we trust the Holy Spirit to guide us and follow where he leads, we have fruit that grows in our life too. It begins to show. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, uh, Paul gives us a list of things, that the fruit of the Spirit. When we live a life that's just with the Holy Spirit, these things naturally flow out of us. Uh, we will be filled with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, and gentleness, and self-control. And the enemy, Satan, would love to have us believe that there's no hope for us, because if we're not 100% excellent in every single one of these things, then God is disappointed. He'd love for us to believe that we are not worthy of salvation if we are not 100% patient, if we are not 100% kind, if we are not 100% any of these things, then somehow God is like, sorry about you, my salvation is not for you. This is a lie, right? Amen? It's a lie. The Holy Spirit is here today to help you grow in these areas, not to shame you because you're not fully there yet. That's the key word, yet. Our hope is in this constant, uh, confident expectation that when we stand before God and he, before the judge in the judgment, that we will not be declared guilty, but clean because of the work of Jesus. So he's not going to look at us and say, sorry, you're not patient. He's going to say, you have the righteousness of Christ. Welcome. All because we believe. So if you lack patience today, the Holy Spirit is here right now to help you grow in patience. If you are in need of joy, the Holy Spirit is here to help you regain your joy. If you lack gentleness, the Holy Spirit is, help you to, is here to help you cultivate gentleness. The Holy Spirit is here to help us strengthen the weak areas in our life so that we can have joy and peace while we wait for the full portion of our inheritance. 
That is the taste of our glorious, ex glorious inheritance. The fruit that comes from living a life being helped and guided by the Holy Spirit, who is God's presence in us right now. And we have a God that gives us his children wisdom, joy, peace, kindness, self-control, which is the opposite of what sin gives us. God gives us himself. He is the glorious riches of our inheritance, and he frees up our lives to say no to sin and say yes to a life lived fully, a life lived in loving God fully without any restraint, without being held down by sin. The Holy Spirit helps us develop grace for ourselves and for others. So is there an area in your life where you need the Holy Spirit to come help you develop grace? Is there an area that you feel that God may be keeping you from fully enjoying being a child of God? Maybe you lack patience. You get too worked up when someone cuts you off while you're driving, or, or maybe that pers there's a person in your life that maybe just always rubs you the wrong way. The Holy Spirit wants to help you develop patience. Ask him for help. Ask him to help you recognize those moments where he's asking you to grow, when impatience seems to well up. Maybe you feel like you're lacking peace. Anxiety and stress and worry overcome you. Maybe you feel like God is disappointed in you and that you're not really saved, that he doesn't really love you. Maybe God didn't really save you and all of this is just pretend and for nothing. The Holy Spirit will help you trust God and believe that you are truly a child of God. And as a good father, God does not withhold love and affection when we mess up. He will not withhold his gifts because of your mess ups. The Holy Spirit is here to help develop maturity and grow in faith so that the good news of Jesus might be proclaimed through our life. And that leads us to the third thing the Holy Spirit does for us as God's children. The Holy Spirit empowers us to testify of what Jesus has done. The Holy Spirit helps us, reminds us, and empowers us. Before Jesus ascended, as he, after he re, who rose from the dead, in Acts 1.8, he told his disciples this, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would help us, counsel us, comfort us, and that he would empower us. After Jesus went away, his disciples were in waiting mode. What now? They were commanded to make disciples of every nation. How do they do that without Jesus in the world? Jesus has gone away. And as they gathered in the upper room at Pentecost, this is found in the first two chapters of the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit came down and covered them. And it was this seminal moment that in the book of Acts when the promised helper, the Holy Spirit, came down and showed up and then the disciples were empowered to preach and teach and testify to whoever would listen. After this moment in Acts, the church exploded. It, it, and it scared people who were in power because all of a sudden, this, this tiny little group was growing and growing and growing by the thousands very quickly. The good, the good news of Jesus was being proclaimed everywhere, and people were coming to know the hope that is only found in Jesus. This is our inheritance. As individuals and as a church. Generations Church has a history of Holy Spirit empowerment. In our church and in our denomination, it's in our DNA as an Assembly of God church, when the Holy Spirit began breaking out and people were praying and feeling filled with the Spirit a hundred years ago, and it's just rapid-fire movement everywhere. And we are the children of that. 
We are here because of the Holy Spirit movement in the people of God. Because people were empowered to preach and testify to what God was doing in their communities. We want to be a church who does that. Amen? Amen. We want to be a church that is empowered by the Holy Spirit in order to testify of the victory of Jesus in our lives, in our church, in our city, in our state, in our country, and into the entire world. The Holy Spirit empowers us to testify of the good news of what Jesus has done. You and I have been made new. We have a new identity, a new family. We are a new person, all because of what Jesus has done. And the same is available to anyone who would believe. So over the last six months, year or so, I've been praying a very dangerous prayer. Uh, this prayer, I have started asking God to reveal to me moments of divine opportunity. It's like that God would open my eyes to those moments he would, he's giving me to testify of his power and his goodness. Um, a few months ago, I was at the gym, and I, I, was, I go to a gym, or I have a trainer, and uh, my trainer was talking to me after the gym session, and he's, he started talking about, I don't remember how we got onto this topic, but he started talking about how there was a monster living in each of us that we have to, like, uh, control and just kind of suppress is like if, if we if we could just let it out and then people get hurt and I I heard the Holy Spirit say hey Robin remember that prayer that you prayed this is that moment and I was like okay and so the Holy Spirit opened up an opportunity for me to be like let me tell you about that monster. <laughs> and so the Holy Spirit opened up that opportunity for me to testify of what Jesus did. Because it opened up an opportunity for me to talk about what sin is. And how sin is that monster. And how Jesus came, that we can't just control it by ourselves because it's always there and it's always going to come out. And I, and I told him, and I, I looked at him and I said, and he knew, he knew I worked at a church and I was like, this is what I believe, Joel. And I, and I just told him, I was like, this is what Jesus did. Because we were talking about religion, too. And he looked at me like, huh. <laughs> like, I, I don't know what that did in his life, but God empowered me in that moment to notice an opportunity to take it and preach the gospel. And I, yeah, so... It's, a, it's crazy. Like, I'm, I'm noticing more and more of those opportunities showing up because the Holy Spirit has empowered me because he's in me and, that, and to tell of the good news of Jesus. The people of Gresham need our testimony. So many people outside of this gathering, outside of these walls, are in need of the hope that we have that confident expectation of everything is going to be good and renewed in the future. They need to know that they are children of God. They need to know that there's a place where they belong, that sin, that monster has already been dealt with, that it cannot control us, and that Jesus already won the victory. Wouldn't it be great if if our community of believers were empowered by the Holy Spirit to, to, to just be that kind of witness? What do you think may happen that if we as a church body came together in prayer and consistently sought the Holy Spirit? Yes. What if we became a people who fell in love with prayer? Yes. Imagine with me that if every single person listening right now began to walk deeply in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We may just experience revival. All kinds of people coming and, or finding hope in Jesus. We may be, see people healed. We might see marriages revive 
families becoming healthy and reconciling. We may see deliverance from addiction. We may see animosity between different groups fade away as we come in unity at the cross. And we may see transformation in our city that would only be done by the power of God. And we want to see life flourish in our city. It seems kind of crazy right now, our city. And we want Jesus to come in and heal what is broken. That is the wealth of God's glorious inheritance. It's God's spirit moving and, part, and, and, and people coming to faith and life flourishing. Where people all over would come to know Jesus and come to know a life of peace and joy and love and the way we were created to have before sin took over. Living in God's presence. One of the ways that we can do that together is once a month we have a prayer and worship night. Next week, next Sunday evening, come and join us as we pray for Gresham. We need the Holy Spirit to empower us, for us to care, for us to love Gresham in this way. The empowerment of the Holy Spirit gives us boldness and courage to follow Jesus without restraint without fear, without hesitancy. So when you pray, when you, when you pray today, later, tomorrow, whenever you pray, I encourage you, pray to the Holy Spirit. He is God with you right now. Ask him to empower you. He is your helper, your comforter. He's the one who is with you. He wants to help you testify of the good news of Jesus, and he wants to give you the right words to say. Because I, don't, I have a hard time sometimes knowing what the right words to say are. Um, but the disciples of Jesus, they were uneducated people. They were not of the elite. They didn't know the right words to say. But the empowerment of the Holy Spirit provided them courage. In the, in, in the beginning of Acts, we see that as Peter and some of the other disciples stand up and preach. And... In Acts chapter 4, 13, it says that when they saw the courage of Peter and John, the people outside of the faith, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men had be, been with Jesus. And they stood up and preached because the Holy Spirit empowered them to do so and gave them the words to say and made it what people needed to hear. I want that. We don't have to be eloquent or classy or even know that much. All we need to know is that Jesus died and rose again, and it is only through him that we're saved. You only need the Holy Spirit to be able to preach that to others. So I encourage you today, begin to trust in the Holy Spirit's leading. When you feel prompted to pray for a stranger, step out in faith and pray. When you feel compelled to share the gospel, step out in faith and speak. When you are being asked to do something by the Holy Spirit that may feel uncomfortable or silly, trust the Holy Spirit's empowerment in you and watch what God does. Because he'll do some crazy things. So worship team, if you can come on up. We um, are going to do communion together. Um, so if you did not get a communion cup, please raise your hand, and um, we'll have Brendan come bring you some. Stepping out in faith and trusting the Holy Spirit is something that I am still learning how to do. There are so many areas in my life where the Holy Spirit needs to help me grow, times that he needs to remind me of who I am and moments when I don't listen to his prompting. Yet, the Holy Spirit reminds us of the gospel, helps us live as children, and the Holy Spirit empowers us to be witnesses of what God has done anyway. And one of the ways we get to participate in all three of these together is communion. By drinking the cup and eating the bread, we proclaim that we have been adopted by God. Believing 
that Jesus is who he proclaimed to be and that he did what the Bible claims he did. Through that, the Holy Spirit reminds us of what Jesus did for us and reminds us of who we are now. And through it, the Holy Spirit empowers us to partake as witnesses of his glorious grace and love as both individuals and as a body together. The riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints is a life empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's the taste of what is to come. And each of us have been adopted as his children, which means that we have been united by the Holy Spirit into the same family. Communion is a family meal. It's a meal that we eat and drink together because all of us have the same Father and we celebrate what he has done. We come together to remember what he has done. We eat the bread and drink the cup as brothers and sisters in unity to celebrate our new identity as we wait for, for the full portion. Jesus, thank you for what you've done. Thank you for your body that was broken for us, that would unite us in faith. And as we take the bread, we remember what you've done. You are a good Father God who sent your Son so that we could be united with you again. Let's eat. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood that was spilled, that has purified us from our sin. That no matter what we do in this life, your blood has covered it, and we are saved because of you. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for being here with us as we drink the cup. Holy Spirit, thank you for being in this place. Thank you for being present as God with us right now. Thank you for being the proof of our adoption as sons and daughters of God and being the taste of what our inheritance is. Thank you for uniting us in the Spirit. Thank you for, for, for helping us see each other as brothers and sisters who are worthy of love by you and by us and by each other. I pray, Holy Spirit, that every single person in this room would know for sure, with confident assurance, that they are sons and daughters of God, empowered by the Holy Spirit, their helper and their reminder to witness and bear testimony of the goodness of God and the good news of Jesus. I pray, Holy Spirit, that every single person would not just feel your presence, but they would know with confidence that you are with them every second of every day, always there helping and reminding. We're going to move in this last song. But before we do, but this is a kind of a word to respond to. <laughs> you know the Holy Spirit's not an it. It's a person. And it's a person to be experienced. He, he's, he's to be related with. And, and as we've gone through these points, He's going to remind us. He's going to teach us. He's going to empower us. I was reminded of this promise of Jesus. I think we talked about it a little bit last week. He says, ask and you will be given. Seek, you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. 
For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks it will be open. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead give of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. We heard a great story of a father giving giving gifts to his daughter today. That, that's the kind of relationship we have with our father. We've been adopted into the family of God. He loves you. You're, you're his own. And if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children, we know that fatherly paternal love, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. So I think it's incumbent upon us to ask. Do you want this in your life? I do. I really do. Oh, well, I've received the Holy Spirit before. So have I. <laughs> but you know, there's more. There's more. There's always more. He gives his spirit, the Bible says, without measure. Well, here's a cup for you. Here's a cup for you. That's all you get. No, you can get as much as you desire. You just have a little taste now because you're going to get a whole bowl of it later. You might not get the full measure like you will have when you come face to face with Jesus, but you can sure have a whole bunch more today. So if this is something you want, I'm going to ask you to open up your hands. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. 